morning, everyone, and, and thank you uh, for being here. On behalf of the City of Chicago and the Department of Buildings, um, we're very excited that so many people are interested in this topic. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to cover Chicago's process for modernizing the building requirements and highlight some of the important changes for small residential buildings, but there's lots of material we won't be able to cover today. For those looking to learn more, there's many published resources. That's one of the advantages of moving towards alignment with uh, national model codes. Uh, so there's lots of resources out there about understanding the international codes. Just a few are up on the screen. And in addition to these print resources that are out there, there's lots of programs. The department will be offering more programs. The home builders, as you heard, will be offering more programs. And other organizations will be offering programs over the course of the next year as we transition into this new code by the mandatory deadline of August 1st, 2020. <coughs> when possible, we'll make recordings of those presentations available on our website, Department of Buildings, chicago.gov slash buildings. Um, it's in your email, it's up here on the screen. Also, we have email alerts. We don't try and fill your email box. Maybe it's about one a month. Um, so you can sign up for that on our website. And also, as Paul said, there's a page with specific information, all the links related to code modernization. It's that uh, sort of horizontal picture a little bit down the page on the Department of Buildings website. Uh, I think it's a sunset. It probably should be a sunrise, but um, we'll, we'll work on getting a better picture for that. Um, there's also already on that page, uh, there's a link to videos of a session we did in May with AIA Chicago a general introduction to the code and some specific definitions and walking through uh, what that is. So if you haven't already seen that, I'd recommend it. Um, so the 2015 to 2021 code modernization process. Under the leadership of Commissioner Friedland, the Department of Buildings began a multi-year effort uh, a few years ago now to comprehensively update the Chicago Building Code, uh, now the Chicago Construction Codes, and the first phase of that, the city adopted updated electrical and conveyance device or elevator code requirements in 2017 and 2018. Because these new codes were developed with input from a range of industry stakeholders, the implementation was remarkably spooked. And both of those codes had about a six month phase in period. We have a slightly longer period uh, with the codes that are coming next. That brings us to phase two, the core requirements for constructing and rehabbing buildings, including fire protection, structural, energy efficiency. Uh, some of these parts of the building code have not been comprehensively revised since 1949. Uh, that's 70 years, so there's certainly been interim amendments, but it's a little bit piecemeal in our code today. And recognizing that, uh, we also were aware that Chicago was the last city in the country not to be aligned with the International Building Code. So after a couple of starts, as Paul has mentioned over the last uh, several <laughs> years, we finally got there this year. Uh, we'll be covering phase two, the codes that are up on the screen uh, in more detail later this morning. Um, but just to acknowledge there is still more to do, uh, plumbing and mechanical are currently in the planning phases. We're hoping to work on those codes uh, starting in 2020 and have them phase in with changes in 2021, which will uh, get us through this current cycle. Also touching some things about signs and trade licensing as final pieces to this code modernization effort. For plumbing, uh, probably some of you in the room are aware of the department's plumbing pilot program that we launched about a year ago, a little over a year. Um, that allows the use of PVC for drain waste and vent piping in certain buildings up to four stories, a little bit broader than we've allowed in the past. Uh, that saved uh, owners documented 15 million plus to date, uh, and that pilot program will remain in place until we have permanent plumbing code changes whenever those come next year or, or later. Um, the city is also committed to a number of zoning reforms that the mayor is starting to work on uh, with the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, we won't be covering those today, uh, but those will be coming too, and part of the city's commitment to working on affordable housing, attainable housing, all sorts of housing and making our requirements uh, more user friendly. So phase two would not have been possible without the tremendous amount of industry support that we had, a range of groups. Um, over a hundred groups, firms were involved in the process, including our host today, the Home Builders Association of Greater Chicago, uh, 
Uh, our former mayor brought all of those groups together, groups that sometimes don't always play nice, uh, brought them into a room in December and, and made very clear in a memorable way that he wanted this part of the code done uh, before he left office. And uh, ordinance did pass in April. So between December and March, the city had a draft that it had been working on internally for about a year and a half before we started the more external process. But between December and March, the city's initial draft was reviewed and debated, sometimes line by line, uh, by six technical working groups. And yes, they did meet in December and almost uh, didn't take a break for holidays um, because that's what the schedule demanded. Um, so over 70 volunteer architects and engineers, we have two of them here this morning, uh, Lou and Carl, my co-presenters this morning, co-chaired two of those six working groups. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, and then it advanced to City Council. Um, it was introduced in March, it passed in April, and it's already started to phase in. So the first thing that phased in was probably the more minor of the changes. So Chicago's Energy Code, it's updated in the past. Uh, it updated again from being based on the 2015 edition to the 2018 edition. Uh, it incorporates the 2018 edition of the International Energy Conservation Code and then also the Illinois Amendments. Um, Chicago's roof requirements that have been out there for a while about reflective roofs or green roofs um, are still there. They've just moved to the roofing chapter of the new building code. Uh, in July, new administrative provisions took effect, streamlining the process and the language governing the processes about topics like permit issuance, inspection, stop work orders, and things like that. So those are more internally focused for uh, getting the department ready for this code change. It's largely preserving how those processes worked in the past. Uh, the biggest changes, the ones you're most interested in, I think, are the new building code and the new building rehabilitation code. Those become optional uh, on December 1st of this year and mandatory for permit applications started on or after August 1st of 2020. So we still have about a year before they become required um, but there are two changes that will take effect a little bit sooner than that. Uh, the first is for project with accessibility requirements, and I know small residential buildings that we're talking about today often don't have any. Um, the new accessibility requirements drafted to align with the 2018 Illinois Accessibility Code, uh, changes in the ADA since Chicago last updated its accessibility provisions, those will phase in and apply to all permit applications started on or after December 1st of this year. Um, and then for residential buildings with four or more units uh, starting January 1st of 2020 for permit applications started on or after January 1st of 2020, new residential buildings with four or more units will have to have a sprinkler system. There's also some specialized requirements if you have co-living uh, or other changes of use. Um, this resolves a long-standing confusion, interaction uh, between the Illinois Fire Code and Chicago's Building Code. We're currently working with the International Code Council, ICC, uh, to publish user-friendly versions of the Chicago Code, so taking Chicago's amendments, which you can find online now, uh, and integrating them with the model code text in, in one book, so the, we expect the books will look something like uh, this, what's up on the screen. There will be a free read-only version available to the public uh, online and then you will be able to buy print or uh, downloadable electronic versions from ICC. So if you work on small residential buildings, what's important to know? First, Chicago did not adopt a residential code separately from the building code. So you may be familiar with suburbs or other places that enforce a version of the International Residential Code. We aren't going to have an equivalent of that here. In Chicago, requirements for small residential buildings will be integrated into the building code book. To accomplish that, we created a Chicago Occupancy Classification R5. So if you're familiar with the IBC, it has a Occupancy Classification R1, R2, R3, R4. R5 is going to be one to three unit residential buildings, non-transient up to four stories, and associated garages. Townhouses will qualify if they're in groups of three, or if every group of three is separated by four hour firewall. If there are larger groups of townhouses without that, or larger apartment buildings with four or more units, then they'll be group R2 consistent with the IBC. What requirements are different for group R5? So recognizing that different requirements, 
recognizing that uh, generally accessibility requirements don't apply unless the project receives zoning approval through the plan development process, um, accessibility generally won't apply. Of course, the city always encourages accessible design features or universal design features where possible. Uh, sprinklers also will not be required in group R5 buildings, one to three unit buildings as today. Um, also as today, there will be bonuses or exiting trade-offs uh, in buildings that do have sprinkler systems. And NFPA 13D, which are generally only allowed for one and two unit buildings, will be allowed in three unit buildings up to three stories. Uh, to get those same trade-off benefits in Chicago. Uh, well, today the wind engineering requirements in the Chicago Code are the same for a one-story single-family home and a 15-story hospital. Um, in the new code, those standards for single-family homes for small residential buildings will be reduced consistent with the national standard, ASC 7. It's about a 20% reduction, although it's not perfect math. Um, seismic will apply to some larger buildings in Chicago. You may hear that seismic is coming, um, but for small residential buildings, seismic is never going to control, and for one to three unit buildings, you can ignore it entirely. Uh, there's also some prescriptive options out there in the IBC that are available for these small residential buildings if they're wood or metal frame. Uh, standards for private porches and decks, um, also balconies will be changed to be more consistent with national codes. So when it's a shared or common porch or deck, it will have the same standards today, 100 pounds per square foot. Um, but a private balcony deck porch for a single family home, for example, will be reduced to a design live load of 60 pounds per square foot. The minimum guardrail height is also changing in residential units up to three stories. Uh, that's reduced from 42 inches today to 36, again, consistent with the residential requirements applied elsewhere. The minimum ceiling height within a dwelling unit will also be reduced from 7 foot 6 today to 7 feet. We expect this will make it easier to legally convert existing basement or attic space without expensive excavation or structural changes. R5, Chicago, current provisions for steeper stairs, uh, tighter winders will also remain in effect, so I know that's important for building on our small lots especially. There are also some new provisions in this code for allowing lofts that would be accessible by stairs or ladders uh, up to 150 square feet. Um, and that applies within any type of dwelling unit if that's an option that is interested to you. And that comes from the model residential code. And in larger buildings, common stairs are going to be meeting those national rise run standards. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, uh, IBC, IRC have this idea of egress windows that people are going to be exiting out their windows. We will not have that requirement in Chicago. Many of the exiting requirements uh, say the same as they are today in terms of one exit and stair sizing, uh, especially in these small residential buildings where our land development patterns are adapted to that. So now I'm going to turn things over to Lou Wilson uh, to speak a little bit more about some of the projects that he works on all the time and give you some more detail about this new code. My name is Lou Wilson. I'm an architect with Sullivan, Goulet & Wilson Architects here in Chicago. And I was uh, glad to help uh, rewrite the Chicago Code and work on the small buildings, uh, small residential uh, uh, chapters. Uh, before we start, I want to just give you a few ground rules for uh, the presentation that I'll give. Uh, in general, I will only be addressing building code. I will not address zoning. Uh, different department, different set of rules. Um, uh, uh, we will be looking at a couple of different construction types as they relate to R5 and other residential uh, occupancies, but generally it's because um, small residential, I'm sure when you were signing up, meant different things to different people. Uh, some might think it's just single family, some might think it's up to a three flat, and some larger developers might believe that it's five stories and 20 units. So in general, we wanted to uh, make sure that you understand that what we're talking about is R5, three, one, two, or three units, four or fewer stories. Um, 
Another thing uh, that you'll notice as we go through, uh, much as Grant showed in his presentation, uh, the building code will be listed as B, the electrical code is listed as E, um, and it follows that ICC family of code designations. Uh, the same thing will become true of occupancy types. Um, whereas currently residential in the Chicago Code is an A occupancy, it will become a phi, uh, an R occupancy. Uh, a will become assembly, B, business, that, that sort of thing. So um, just so you're oriented a little, uh, little closer. Um, and with that, um, the primary types of construction that we're looking at for this uh, presentation right now is type 1C, which there's going to be a change in nomenclature it will become type 2A. Uh, it's not a direct, uh, but it's kind of complicated to uh, explain. It's very comparable. Um, uh, so what was the type 1C in current code really becomes 2A. Likewise, what was 3B in the current code, what you're used to thinking of, becomes 3A and what was the combustible frame type 4A becomes type 5A. The thing that happens is they're going to slip in um, a classification 4, which will be heavy timber, uh, with no A or B. It's a single classification. And as we go uh, on to the further slides, uh, if you're seeing a B or a C in the presentation, you'll know it's related to the current code uh, because I'm really only going to address the A category of the new code, which is slightly more restrictive in terms of hourly ratings, but uh, more generous in terms of uh, benefit. Okay, well, um, in uh, type 1C, which will become 2A, uh, it's typically used in mid-rise residential. It's a steel frame and stud, uh, concrete and metal deck floors, or perhaps plank, and a non-combustible exterior skin. It's usually used for four to six stories. It's uh, uneconomical below that, uh, and uh, you have to go to a higher rating to get above it. Um, in this case, it's actually much larger than what an R5 would typically be. Um, but what this would allow you to do is have mixed use, uh, perhaps parking, ground floor retail, or business, and that sort of thing, which R5 does not. There is no, there is no mixed use in the R5. Um, this is just an example of uh, a typical, uh, you know, uh, type 2A construction. So then we come to the type 3B, which now becomes 3A, uh, what many of you might refer to as bricks and sticks. It's a masonry exterior or protected steel stud, uh, protected with jip and sheathing and so forth. Uh, also, again, with a non-combustible exterior skin, be it, uh, you know, a, a thick or a thin skin, uh, that'll have implication as to uh, what the, uh, the interior materials might be, such as a uh, requirement for non-combustible insulation on your continuous insulation layer and that sort of thing. However, the interior of the building, uh, walls, uh, Floors, roof are all combustible, uh, either solid wood, open web wood, joist, anything of that nature. And again, uh, wood decked floors, which may or may not have uh, topping. So again, this is, you know, your typical, like I say, bricks and sticks, quite suitable for single family, two flats and three flats. Um, um, and again, the new code uh, will allow for really the same type of uh, three-flat uh, construction you typically see, 
a duplex down, simplex, duplex up, as long as you don't exceed those three units or four stories. And then finally, uh, combustible frame, 4A becomes 5A. And pretty much it's wood construction, top to bottom. Uh, one to three stories, typically. Um, um, so it's your single family and smaller residential style uh, street fronts. So we get to the residential height limitations. Current code for 1C <coughs> is six stories and 80 feet. We now translate that into the 2A non-sprinklered would be six stories and 65 feet, or in the case of the R5, which is what we, because you're limited to the four stories, it'll become four stories and 65 feet. If we add sprinkler to that, the 2A becomes six stories and 85 feet. So you've gained five feet off the old, the old height. Um, and again, the R5 really uh, becomes four and 85, four stories and 85 feet, although I doubt you'd ever get to that. Uh, type 3B, which previously was four stories, 55 feet, uh, again, in the non-sprinkler, becomes four stories and 55 and stays four stories and 55 for the R5. When you go to the sprinkler, you now increase to five stories and 70 feet. Again, unlike, well, I get you would get to that, but your R5 uh, would be four stories and, and 85, which would be highly unlikely. Um, and the type 4A becomes 5A. Um, it was three stories, 40 feet becomes two stories and 40 feet, uh, non-sprinklered, uh, stays uh, at the R5, it becomes three stories, 40 feet. Type 5A sprinklered becomes four stories and 55 feet, same for the uh, R5. Now, again, your current uh, allowable areas, uh, tabular areas within the, uh, the current code. Type 1C, you take the tabular area for a two-story, one or two, yeah, uh, two-story. If you go to a three-story, it's 0.9%, uh, uh, it's 90% of that. And if you go to a fourth story, it's 85%. So a type 1C becomes 20,000 square foot, three story becomes 18, four story becomes 17,000. Same concept for the 3B, you start at uh, the 8,000 and work your way down. Uh, in the 4A, you're really capped at the two stories. So uh, you can have the third story of 800 square foot, um, which is uh, not, a, not a full story. In the um, same scenario, but if you add sprinklering, you essentially double each of those areas um, until you get down to the uh, type 4A which will become or stay 4,000 with an 800 square foot third floor. When you go to the new code, uh, type 2A has a tabular area of 72,000 square foot per building. And I want to just go back. Um, in the current code, these numbers are per floor which are then multiplied by your allowable number of floors and then ultimately capped by FAR or, or maximum area. Uh, in the new code, um, the area starts out as tabular square foot per building. The modifiers for that 
uh, and we'll get to the formula in just a moment. For a non-sprinklered building, with the assumption of complete frontage, uh, there, I, I've made no reductions for frontage on this, uh, would double um, your tabular area. So your allowable in a non-sprinkler 2A would become 144,000 square feet divided by your maximum number of floors or your ultimate number of floors. Type 3A works same and 5A obviously the same. If you sprinkler the building, you get another 100% increase on your initial tabular area, meaning that your 72,000 now is multiplied by three, brings you up to 216,000 per building. Likewise, type 3A, 90,000, type 5A, 45. Okay, the way that formula works is your allowable area increase is your base area tabular times your frontage over perimeter, uh, your, your frontage uh, in the new code uh, is between 20 and 30 feet, you get a, uh, a, a bonus for that where currently you only get a bonus if it's 30 feet or wider. Um, and if you have 30 feet, you get a higher percentage of bonus. But in this case, what I've taken is 100% foot uh, uh, frontage with 30 or more foot of open area. So making it simple to give you a frontage of one, 100. Uh, and then your non-sprinklered factor, the NS equals one, is given to you per code. Uh, it's in the chart, you, in a sprinklered building, it's two, in a non-sprinklered, it's one. So at the end of the day, you get one times one times one plus one, meaning you get a two. In your sprinklered building, you're getting a one times one <coughs> times two, meaning you get two added on to your base. So uh, your increase is substantially larger. Um, again, just as a note, sprinkling will be required in all but the R5 occupancies uh, and with you know, some very minor exceptions. So it's one, two, or three units, four stories or less. Uh, the overall frontage increases will be reduced from 150% currently to 100% or that factor of one, as I discussed. But again, it is somewhat offset by the fact that you do get a small percentage for that kind of gray area between 20 and 30 foot of, front, of uh, uh, free space. Um, the other drop down will be open but covered areas, uh, porches and so forth, decks, uh, will count as area. So if even if the sides are open but it is roofed or covered, it will count as area. Uh, again, the feeling is that there's enough area built into the original tabular areas with modifiers that it really should not affect the overall end result. Um, so if we look at uh, fire ratings of exterior bearing walls, um, on a 1C currently that's a two hour rating. What happens is that the, the modifier is for the 2A or the new code uh, from zero uh, to less than three feet uh, will be a two hour requirement. From three foot to less than 30 becomes a one hour and above 30 feet there's no requirement for rating. Likewise 3B which currently is a three hour rating 
drops to a two at that zero to just less than three. Three to 30 becomes one and above 30, zero. The one A, one hour, uh, uh, becomes increased in the zero to less than three foot, uh, but at three foot drops to an hour. Um, in Grant's uh, original presentation, he mentioned the townhome separations. What will happen now is townhomes will be rated to the exterior wall the same as the, uh, as the last slide which brings you to a two hour enclosure, depending on your uh, distance to a lot line. Uh, and you will be allowed to have three townhomes in a row. After three, fourth to sixth, you will have to have a four hour firewall between each group of units. So what would happen is you'd have a two hour enclosing wall, one hour separating the two interior units, and then a four hour firewall to then take you to the next series of, of, uh, of townhomes. Be it, you know, let's say it was three, again, it would be a one hour, one hour, two hour enclosing wall. And that continues on for as far as your uh, townhome takes you. Um, Fire ratings for exterior non-bearing walls. Um, again, uh, Chicago code has it pretty much, or current code has it as a 2-1-1. Um, the, the new code will be up to three feet, uh, will be two. Three foot to just up to 30 will be one and then zero, similar to the uh, bearing wall enclosures uh, and it, it really is all based on distance to lot line. Um, the other thing that we'll discuss in a, in a few moments is the openings in those walls uh, for windows and so forth. Uh, you will now be uh, for non-protected openings you'll be limited to the uh, uh, percentage of wall opening. Uh, good news is type three construction currently requires a parapet above the roof. Uh, um, in the 2020 code, um, no parapet will be required as long as you have a class C or better roof covering and you protect the deck for four feet around the perimeter of the, uh, of the building. Uh, and that can be either a non-combustible or a, uh, a protected deck. Um, the current code allows a single exit from the third floor if it's uh, under 800 square feet or if the building is sprinklered, fully sprinklered. Uh, the single exit rules really will be uh, very, very similar for the new code. So. Uh, not, not much change there. And again, the current code requires a 42 inch high guardrail. Uh, that will be reduced to a 36 inch in the R5. Um, live loading for privately accessed porches and decks will be reduced from the current 100 pound live load to 60 pound. Um, that is specifically for privately accessed decks and porches. Um, uh, your back porch, you know, exiting from the third floor or whatever, um, it will be maintained at 100 pound live load because it's, it's accessed by more than one unit. Uh, this is the same uh, comment on the seismic and wind loading that uh, Grant went through. Um, R5 will now have opening size requirements for windows and glazing, limiting the percentage of openings based on uh, distance to the property line. And what that 
graphically means is at zero feet you get zero openings. Um, at two feet you get 10% of protected openings or the building must be sprinklered. At three feet you are now allowed up to 25% and at five foot you then reach the uh, no limit on, on glazing. Uh, on the non-sprinklered and unprotected building uh, openings, uh, again, zero foot is zero. At two foot, you're allowed 5% of, uh, of, of the wall in unprotected opening. At three foot, you are allowed 25%, and by five foot, you are allowed that same no limit. Uh, currently, exterior stairs are allowed uh, to be 30 foot in height uh, with uh, uh, um, the addition of uh, another 15 feet for the uh, 2020 Chicago Building Code. Yeah. I'll now turn it over to uh, Carl. Thank you very much. Uh, First, I want to say it's a pleasure to be here today, being invited by the Home Builders Association, and also was it's uh, been an honor to have been invited to participate as a co-chair of the uh, city's fire and life safety group, technical working group. I am a, uh, a fire protection engineer by education and uh, practicing with West Janney Elsner Associates here in Chicago. Uh, I've been practicing here in the city for over 40 years. I know it doesn't look like it, but it's true. One of the things I want to talk about, it, and I understand that uh, because a number of our clients had approached us uh, in the last couple of years, uh, Grant touched on this a little bit, but I want to get into it a little bit more detail about the uh, state fire marshal was uh, attempting to enforce its code the NFPA Life Safety Code in the City of Chicago um, and the Chicago Building Code and the NFPA Life Safety Code are not the same and in many cases uh, presented conflicts of trying to enforce one code versus the other. That has been resolved by a recent uh, change in the Illinois state law through Illinois Public Act 101-0082 worked out between the State Fire Marshal's Office and the Chicago Department of Buildings and the Chicago Fire Department. Uh, now the state has, has uh, uh, reached a resolution that the state code does not apply within the city limits of Chicago, except for state-owned buildings or state-licensed buildings like uh, hospitals and daycare facilities. So that is all good news. Um, and, and part of it is because the city has, has brought its codes in greater alignment through this code modernization process. So that was a step in that direction. <clears throat> a, couple of, uh, a couple of things that affect small residential buildings. There are a number of differences between the uh, IBC and the city of Chicago's new code, uh, changes in, in some of the definitions. But a couple that particularly relate to small residential, I've highlighted here. Uh, the fire separation distance is normally the distance between a building and a property line, or in the case of a public way, the distance between the building and the center line of a public way, like the street. The Chicago code definition is a bit different. It measures that distance between the building and the opposite side of that public way or the opposite side of the street. So that distance becomes greater taking advantage of the, uh, of the, of the width of the, the full width of the street rather than just to the center line. So that tends to uh, make the requirement for exterior wall ratings a little more liberal. And that, and that reflects the, the density of the built environment in the city. One item that remains the familiar, uh, if, if you are users of the IBC, we have IBC design folks here, not too many. 
Okay. Uh, if you're familiar with the IBC, you know that the IBC has a, a three-hour firewall. Chicago is maintaining its definition of a firewall being rated at four hours. And when, when there are openings, the double Class A doors on those openings. Uh, however, Chicago has relaxed the, the requirement so that it is, uh, the, the traditional IBC requirement, so that it does not need to be structurally independent on each side of the wall. So that's, uh, that's sort of a compromise between the two. And you've heard already about the uh, new use group R5. I won't, I won't mention that again. Uh, it, but, but I do have the definition that I highlighted here on this next slide. This is the definition of R5, and there are a couple things, again, I want to highlight. An R5 is defined to be residential buildings that are no more than four stories above grade and have one, two, or three dwelling units. Uh, and there are no other occupancies associated with the building, no mixed use with the building. Uh, also allowed uh, having accessory buildings on, on uh, can be defined, provided they're not more than two stories. So that is the definition for an R5 in Chicago. As, the, as uh, Grant mentioned, the IRC is not being used in Chicago. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what I would say is a change in philosophy uh, regarding fire safety within, within, with the new code. The uh, IBC and its document, the IFC, the International Fire Code, s about the last 30 years, since about the mid-80s, has relied upon more what we call active fire suppression systems versus passive. Passive fire protection you can consider to be barriers like firewalls and rated floors and, and rated roofs. Uh, that has serves to provide a compartmentation for fire spread. The IBC over the years has moved to uh, active fire protection such as sprinkler protection, fire detection systems and, and enunciation systems. That has proven to provide a benefit in fire safety that has been measurable across the United States. And so that philosophy now you find in the, in the Chicago Building Code, there are more requirements for sprinklers in, in not just residential but in the commercial building side as well. Uh, and generally speaking, the, the new Chicago Code will provide more liberal allowable areas for sprinkler protection and a little, a little less liberal uh, reliance on uh, street frontage increase, which was kind of a passive thing as well. So that philosophy is, is, uh, is showing in the new code. It will also, by, by doing this, it will also, uh, the new code tends to, uh, well, it doesn't tend to, the new code adopts some of the more modern NFPA standards regarding the design and installation of these active fire suppression systems. And with that, uh, because of the recognition of more modern materials and installation methods, it will tend to lower installation costs for those systems uh, as, as part of the, the mandate for them. Uh, it, it does a, a give a more liberal cost implications. And in the, in the effort, uh, the Chicago Fire Department was a participant on our working committee. And uh, uh, we made sure that the current method of operation the fire department uses uh, with respect to how they approach a building and, and what they expect to find in a building. Uh, for fire sprinkler, water supplies, for example, fire alarm system notification of occupants, uh, stand pipe system operations. Uh, these are the built-in piping systems for fire, fire suppression, manual <laughs> suppression. Those have all been harmonized in the new Chicago Building Code with what the fire department uh, operations have been. Uh, generally also, uh, the electrical requirements associated with these fire protection systems, like fire pumps and fire alarm systems, they have been uh, modified uh, to, to reflect the practices that are in the national codes. <coughs> 
generally somewhat relaxation and generally more cost effective. Similarly, the requirements in the code for carbon monoxide detection have been harmonized with the uh, national standards, national requirements in the international codes, and there are few less requirements for carbon monoxide detection in the new Chicago Building Code. You will find in residential, you will find requirements for carbon monoxide detection in residential uses where there is fuel-fired equipment, like the national standards. Okay, one of the big things you've heard today from both of my colleagues here on the podium, uh, starting in January of next year, no matter whether you use the old code or the new code, there'll be a requirement for automatic sprinkler protection in residential occupancies other than R5s, other than um, where there are three or fewer units, uh, but anything more than uh, four or more units, automatic sprinkler protection will be required. There are, there are some relaxations and, and cost uh, reductions to be uh, sort of the, to, to help this get in process here. The automatic sprinkler systems in residential will not need to be monitored in, in the low-rise residential. They will not need to off-site off -site monitoring. And also there are ways to uh, build low-rise residential without automatic sprinklers. It's been talked about in townhouses, for example, uh, if, if, the unit, if three or fewer units are separated by the four-hour firewalls, no sprinklers are required. Or in our two occupancies, which are multifamily, uh, less than or equal to four stories with two or fewer units in a fire area, uh, sprinklers are, would, would not be required if there are two means of egress uh, using stairways within that, within that uh, fire area. Hold on, please, till the end. Are we talking about 13D? I'll get to that in a minute. How about that? Um, this is a summary of the allowable height in stories based on construction type for residential use, R5s, the R5s and not, not all residential, but this is a summary of the allowable number of stories based on whether the building has no sprinkler protection whether it's using 13D, 13R, or 13. What are, what are the differences? And FPA 13 is the standard for the design and installation of sprinkler systems, essentially in commercial buildings. High-rise residential, you'd be looking at an NFPA 13 system, or other commercial buildings is an NFPA 13 system. Uh, those systems have been around for over 100 years, and they've got a really good track record of success. NFPA 13D, that second line item there in the table, is the standard for the design and installation of sprinklers in one and two family dwellings. When that standard was written in the 1980s, it was intended to provide strictly for the life safety of the occupants, not property protection. And it has somewhat uh, of a robust, less robust of a water supply system and sprinklers are allowed to be omitted in certain areas of the building like attics. So again, it's not quite as, it's not at the same, le not the same league as a 13 system and so there are less uh, allowances for that in, when you read the IBC and also in the Chicago Building Code. And FPA 13R is the design is for the design and installation of sprinkler systems in multifamily residential buildings up to four stories and 60 feet. So that's kind of a compromise between 13 and 13D. It's for larger residential, but again, it's primarily interested in providing for the life safety of the occupants, does not have quite the robust water supply, and does allow sprinklers to be omitted for example, in attic spaces, combustible attic spaces. So again, not quite as robust, 
but better than not having a sprinkler building. So the Chicago Building Code will allow the use of NFPA 13D systems in R5, not even when they're not required. One other major change, uh, the, the IBC in general is a lot more clearer than what you might be used to with the old Chicago Building Code and many of its requirements, including where smoke detection is required. Now, what I've got up on this slide is for the R5 uses, small residential, uh, what we call smoke alarms, are the fully integrated unit that detects the smoke and provides the sound, the audible notification to the, to the occupant in that space. These are not interconnected systems, or de not interconnected detectors that are monitored by a, a control panel or off-site, these are individual detectors. And they are required to be in each sleeping room, outside of the, the sleeping rooms, within 15 feet of those sleeping rooms, uh, in each story of a dwelling unit, and at the top of each interior exit stairway. And these are, these are called, uh, sometimes referred to, they used to be referred to as single station smoke alarms, smoke detectors, now we call them smoke alarms. They are required in the code to be AC powered. You will find them typically with a battery backup, but the code will require new installations to be AC powered. Uh, there's also a third wire on these detectors so that they can be interconnected, such that if one detector is activated, it activates all the detectors that are interconnected. And it's allowed to be integral with a carbon monoxide detector which will also be required and that is the end of our presentation